you so much. Tamara just reminded me that uh, that was Drew's favorite song, and uh, I did have a choice, a few choice words for God when I got the news. But he gives and takes away, and I'm a good friend who flew up here from Florida. We tried to raise you from the dead yesterday, and uh, the enemy's going to pay back sevenfold for what he took from us, maybe starting today. I have a eulogy here. Jack and I were working till 2 in the morning last night. My wife, who lost a sister, so told me these days are just a blur. So here goes. I'm going to read it, if that's okay. I have to thank Westbrook for working with us on some of the multimedia. I was, uh, I have to say this in public, I was very rude in terms of getting that redneck poster of Drew up outside, but I just had to have it. I just thought, it's out of a movie, who walks in and sees the deceased full frontal with the... <laughs> and as Drew told me, in a, his, his eighth grade um, teachers, you know, Drew got into a lot of trouble, uh, just not, not, not bad stuff in eighth grade, but he says, let me tell you something, Dad. see all these bozos here? These teachers won't remember any of them. 20 years from now, they will never forget me. <laughs> and you will never forget this funeral. <clears throat> All right, here we go. Drew Swan, 410-88 to 4313. On his Twitter, on his Pinterest page, it says, Dream as if you'll live forever. Live as if you'll die today. This is hopefully about 15 minutes, so... Sit back and my one shot to try to lift Drew up and honor him. And we have some other people who really want to talk, so I'll try not to drag on. And we'll see how the multimedia goes. If it doesn't go, so what? You guys are here, that's what matters. <clears throat> I sat at my office desk and said a prayer. Tamara had morning sickness, and we suspected that morning that the possibility we could be parents. I asked God, please let it be so. When I came home that night, the way she told me, from the top of the stairs was, I wonder how I'm going to decorate the nursery. I ran up to hug her, and we dedicated our joy to the Lord that night in the parking lot of St. Andrew's Church in Rochester, Michigan. Andrew, hmm, not a bad name, I thought. As Tamara started to show, a godly woman, older woman named Ruth Kempkin, approached her unsolicited and laid her hands on Tamara's stomach. The child in this womb will be used mightily God, she prophesied. Wow, I thought, this kid is a player. Let's see where this takes us. He was 10 days late through night in Pam Ostrander. Didn't make a fool's joke on me that we were having him, and they, 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 they caught me saying, this is it, and running out to left some ketchup on the floor. And everybody loves to play make a fool's jokes on me because I, I apparently have played a few in the past. Um, he was he was 10 days late through 19 hours of labor for Tamara and four Snicker bars for me. The nine pound, four ounce Drew showed his face, that perfect face for the first time. I was stunned. Every nurse confirmed, why yes, that is the most beautiful baby I've ever seen. <laughs> Exhausted as I spilled out into the rising sun that morning from a sleepless night, the feeling overcame me of the purest form. So much so that it was a high watermark, no brainer, new official, happiest day of my life. The vibrating phone next to my bed first awoke my wife, Christine. She reached over me and took a look at the missed call. It was Jack. And it was also 12:30 at night, early morning. He hasn't needed me at night since high school. That can't be good, I thought. And the phone buzzed again, and I answered. Dad? Yes, Jack. Dad, are you sitting up? No. I need you to be sitting up, Dad. Resigned to being about to hear the worst news ever, I sat up. Okay, Jack, I'm sitting up, son. Drew's dead. He only needed to say it once. The 
rest was a lot of screaming, no, cursing at God, and getting dressed to come to Jack. Darned if the kid didn't also create the saddest day of my life. I considered. One of my more glaring character defects was shallowness. Drew showed me pain in places where I did not know I had places. I've often heard from people, I can't imagine. May I officially and collectively tell you, you got that right. So here we are, doing a celebration of Drew's life. Am I the only one who thinks that if you're celebrating what happened to Drew, you're a moron? Actually, that's a little harsh. Not everyone here is a moron. Only Drew's closest friends could be considered in that league. <laughs> I won't mention any names, but you know who you are, Welsh, Patterson, Smoke, Jordan Morris. <laughs> Smoke. Really? When your kid's buddy's name is Smoke, that's a red flag. <laughs> Smoke and Drew hopped in a car Jack's freshman year to help a brother in need out. Jack needed help winning the Beer Olympics at Ferris State, and he had not yet made his mark. Drew decided to step up and recruited Smoke, whose real name I still don't know, to join him on a pilgrimage to Big Rapids, Michigan. Did the Swan Brothers win the Beer Olympics? You tell me. They entered as Ireland. Yes, I am so proud to say they did win that day. Unfortunately, there was some collateral damage. Turns out Drew was un unable to revive Jack in the car when they got back to the dorm. A knockdown, gloves off fight ensued between the two brothers, and the cops were called. They questioned Drew if he was pressing charges. <laughs> For what? He said. Nothing happened. The cop pointed to the blood dripping from Drew's sleeve. Jack had used his teeth in the fight to gain the upper hand. <laughs> At one point, Smoke tried to stop it, only to have his calf severely bit by Jack. <laughs> a night in jail was followed by a headline in the slow news town of Big Rapids titled, Brotherly Love. <laughs> Both boys had made the paper. I was so proud. <laughs> Drew was getting buried with those teeth marks still in him, Jack recently observed. Brotherly Love. Where's Jack? were Drew's first words every morning when he woke up. He had the cute, we had the cutest two boys on record anywhere at any time. And I'm not calling your kid's ugly, I'm just stating matter of facts. <laughs> Nobody was in their league. They were inseparable. If Jack was in Vegas or a Wall Street broker, he made a huge miscalculation. He put all his money on Drew, all his eggs in the Drew basket, all the chips on Drew. Diversification was not considered. And the loss is unbearable. The silver lining, there is none that I can see. A total shipwreck marriage trouble. It was not looking good for Tamara and I in 1993. We went to see renowned author and pastor Stuart Briscoe in his home to see if this marriage could be saved. His conclusion? I've been marriage counseling 25 years and I can tell you unequivocally, yours is the worst marriage that walked through my door. We thought, screw you Stu, we're staying together. And together we had the magic that reached levels that few families I know have ever attained. Family football, business together downtown, five years of homeschooling together, everywhere. The Kill Team, Alliance Bible Church, special breakfasts together, basketball coaching together, baseball coaching, tennis, sailing, tennis, football, tennis, swimming, tennis. The wonder of the homeschooling years is really going to cut into Jack's need for therapy later. We clung to each other, and we loved every stinking minute of it. <sighs> Our version of tubing was to drag Drew and Jack around in a 10 horsepower motor in a semi-deflated inner tube at our family in Michigan cottage. We called it redneck tubing. We were rednecks in a sea of annoyingly successful people in the Lake Country area. How else do you explain those manners outside? By the way, for the record, I'm doing better than y'all. Tamara, whose IQ we suspect is immeasurable, was given a gift of mothering that set a high bar for Drew and Jack. Ever the protege, Tamara took her new toy, Jack's emerging tennis stardom, to the club one day to enter the parent-child tournament. Drew and I were the chauffeurs that day and drove the starlets to Lake Country Record Club. 
as we... <laughs> oh, we're not getting out of this thing without laughing. You know? When I think about Drew, I always laugh. So that's going to help. Um, as we pulled up, we asked, what do you have to do to enter? Tamara replied, you have to belong here and be a parent and a child. Drew and I knew we qualified and what had to be done. Never mind, we were, <laughs> never mind that we were in jeans and looked like bumps. Drew quickly sized it up. Dad, step one, identify the weaker player. Step two, never hit to the stronger player. I added step three, take out the trash. Get in their head with the trash talk and waltz to the winner's circle, which of course we did. We've never let them forget about it then, and I'm not about to stop now. <laughs> the Wonder Years. I often give my unsolicited advice to newbie dads about the three phases of fatherhood. Phase one, gee, my kid could grow up to be president of the United States. Phase two, after you discover brains are taking a back seat to their bra and gee, my kid could be a professional athlete. And the final phase three, after both those dreams die and your kids discover alcohol, drugs, and the opposite sex, your one and only goal is to get them into their 20s alive. Good luck with all that. In seventh grade, we could not control Drew's insatiable curiosity and need for social fun, so we conceded he could go to St. Jerome's. On day one, I walked him in and watched head after cute bobtail head turn at the new kid on the block. Girls were becoming something Girls became uh, something that would sadly be so easy for Drew to have whoever he wanted, whenever he wanted, as long as he wanted. There was simply no thrill at all in the chase. Later, he was voted best looking at Arrowhead, no surprise there. I have heard that Drew made Brad Pitt look slightly homely. <laughs> it was time to drill him harder on biblical values. Drew, Drew bought into it. He has read the one-year Bible through every year since the mid-90s. For the record, he has done at least 25 altar calls, just to be sure. <laughs> this boy wanted nothing to do with hell. If there is a silver lining, it is the gift of the assurance Drew is in heaven. He was a lover, pure of Jesus. By eighth grade, Drew gave me a heads up. Dad, this is who I am. I know exactly who I am. I will never change. Father John at St. Jerome's made Drew come up and tell the school how he had, had risen so quickly in the popularity status. Well, Drew explained. I treat everyone the same, the jocks, the brainiacs, and the losers. Gee, Drew, am I a loser? Half the class chided him. Well, as those inner circle people know, those losers became Drew's best friends, and yes, you know who you are. High school. Okay, this was a rock wild ride, and I was not driving the bus. Drew was. Ferris Bueller, sit down. This is a new master in, in town who knows life goes pretty fast. If you don't stop and look around once in a while, you might miss it. Drew missed nothing. He lived. Oh, how he lived. Young life trips, family vacations to Colorado and Florida and Australia. Listen, mate, we've got a lot of video of Australia. Wow, I watched... I, I, I watched... Uh, I, I wished... Uh, I watched a lot of it and wished I was Drew. I watched it with Jack recently. Drew was accepted into the University of Michigan but opted to stay in Wisconsin. He, his accomplishments include state champion in swimming, all state in tennis. He ran for class president and was a shoe in until his loser friends decided he was such a lock they didn't bother voting. Drew carried the lower half of Arrowhead and was nearly edged out in the upper half. Drew was also a life scout, no small trick. Business. Drew helped me in business and early on I could see he was smarter than me. He always had my back, always, and our friendship was rock solid. He was my biggest and sometimes only fan. I may not have made it without his blind faith in me. This brings us to the addiction salvation part of our discussion. Addiction. If you are addicted, wake up and get help. I did, and I have not drank or drugged over Drew's death. So what's your excuse? Someone hurt your feelings? Listen, if you have a problem, why not ask for help? You need it. My phone number is 248-667-2722. Don't call me to say I'm sorry. Call me to say I need help. I'm there for you. Salvation. This is another easy one. You are at a funeral for a friend. Lucky him, he's in heaven. I am sure I have seen him get saved many times. Hell? That's real. And if you don't know Jesus, I have some bad news for you. And my hands are tied. Friend, you're going to hell when you die. Oh, 
and you're a moron. But if you want to go to heaven and see Drew when you die, that's easy peasy. You just repeat 